No, Leo DiCaprio is too handsome and too... Curtis LeMay is a is a kind of tough guy. He's hard-bitten. In the day, the states me, Charles Bronson would play him. You know, muttering, man a few words, kind of has a kind of physicality to him. Leo DiCaprio doesn't have the kind of necessary physicality. He's too cerebral for that. For Curtis May was like a hands-on pilot. He's like one of the great pilots of his generation. He was famous for like fixing B-29 bombers himself. Like, that's not Leo DiCaprio, right? That's someone else. In my opinion, Malcolm Gladwell is a one-in-a-generation kind of writer. Like F. Scott Fitzgerald, or a more virtuous, thoughtful, and gentle Hemingway, without all the drinking, cavorting, and tragedy. He is Canadian, after all, and very proud of it. In this episode of Behind the Brand, I convinced Malcolm to reveal something personal about himself that most people do not know. In his new book, The Bomber Mafia, he chronicles the history and rivalry between an elite group of chemists and physicists who compete during World War II to see who can help the Allied forces, specifically the United States, win and end the war against Japan. Malcolm is a prolific writer and the author of several of my favorite books, including David and Goliath, Outliers, The Tipping Point, and many others. He's also the host of The Revisionist Podcast, which I also recommend checking out. He has an uncanny way of finding the story behind the story and pointing out the most important lessons often hiding or undocumented and fascinating true stories in history. I know you'll love this episode with the incomparable Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, my name is Malcolm Gladwell. I'm a podcaster and writer and the author of the upcoming Bomber Mafia. And you're listening to Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with the incomparable Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm, welcome to the show. Thank you. Delighted to be here. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? Which job? Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back in the chronology because uh, people may know you um, for your various works, you know, whether it's um, mm -hmm. your prolific books, um, your editorial could be your podcasts, etc., um, even your master class. But let's go back in the chronology to young Malcolm. Um, and I often ask this question, like, what did you want to be when you grew up? What were you thinking of? What was, what was young Malcolm dreaming about? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, I, there was a period, very brief period. Uh, first of all, I never thought about that question until I was a senior in college. And then I decided I wanted to go into advertising, and I tried and failed to get a job in advertising. Um, and then I applied on a lark for a job at a magazine in America. I was in Canada and got the job um, quite by accident and quite by surprise. And that was it. I, that's why I became a journalist. I got a job for $9,000 a year as an assistant editor on a kind of mildly disreputable right-wing magazine. <laughs> can you can you say which one it was? I'm curious. It's called it's called the American Spectator. Actually, I had such I had a lot of fun there. I didn't last very long, but I had a lot of fun there. Well, and and I asked that question with context. The context is this, you know, um, I think to oversimplify things a little bit, there's two camps of people right now. You know, there's a whole group of people who are young coming, you know, out of high school or maybe college, and they're thinking, what, are, what am I going to do with my life? And then because of the current pandemic and situation, there's a whole group of middle-aged people who are, you know, either downsized, lost their job, and they're having to reset, and they're thinking, what am I going to do with my life? And so um, I like to talk about signals and, you know, like how you know what you want to do, how you find your passion. But like, did you have influences from your parents? Like, did they steer you in a certain direction? Did they say, Malcolm, we want you to become, uh, you know, a plumber or a scientist or, uh, you know, run a flower shop or something? Uh, zero explicit direction by design, I think. Um, you know, I think they were totally open to whatever I wanted to do. It never came up. I don't, my parents provided... I think they recognized that I didn't really want any kind of direction, so they never provided it. Um, and uh, they, my mom, you know, was a writer, and so there was a kind of um, uh, implicit, I suppose, 
endorsement of that line of, but um, she would never have said it, that I should be a writer too because she was a writer. In fact, you know, writing was not her profession. Her profession was, she was a family therapist. Um, so no, there wasn't. It was all very. It's all, it's all happenstance. There is no. There there was, and is no plan. Mm. Well, what was it about advertising, for example? Like, were you interested in selling things, or was it more like behavioral patterns, like why people buy? What was what was the the, the magnetism to advertising? Um, well, I couldn't really think of anything else, and I liked the idea. I you know I was always a fan of advertising. I thought that to tell a story in thirty seconds struck struck me then and strikes me to this day as the most incredible, hard, fantastic, brilliant thing you can do. I mean, I'm in awe of TV commercials to this day. Good ones are, they're extraordinary. They're like, now, and now that I tell stories for a living, I know how insanely hard it is to tell a story in 30 seconds. But back then it struck me as, and I used to do ads. One of the ways I amused myself in college was I decided with a friend to do a kind of tongue-in-cheek marketing campaign for the school football team, which was a team that uh, no one cared about, no one attended the games. And it was it was not the not the varsity football game team, the inter, the um, intramural football team. And so we they were called the Pelicans. And so I started something called Pelican Power. And it was unexpectedly successful, my campaign. And people started going to the games, and then they won the championship, the Mullock Cup. And I was sort of part of, you know, the celebration, because I was their PR guy. And I that I just thought that was kind of fun. So I got it. I, I thought, oh, maybe I should be an advertising person. We have that in common, actually. I, I had sort of the same kind of path where I was making up fun commercials, um, even sometimes ironically. Uh, and also something you just said, kind of it sounds like something Mark Twain said a while ago, which is contrary to what a lot of people think, you know, you think, you know, to give a long speech or to tell a long story, or write a long book, that's really difficult. But I think Twain said, you know, to write the shorter story, that's where it really takes a lot of discipline and practice because you have yes. to... Yes, I am writing you a long letter because I haven't the time to write you a short letter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, totally relatable. Um, and and so you've had this uh, career as a writer, um, a storyteller. You know, this show, we talk about brands a lot. It's called Behind the Brand. And the premise is, you know, it's the, it's a, it's, you know, it's about entrepreneurs, innovators, um, other people and the stories behind their success. So what do you think, what is the Malcolm Gladwell brand? Um, if I'm talking to Seth Godin, he would push back and say, Brian, I, I am not a brand. I'm a human being. But for the sake of this, you know, discussion of, of brands, um, what is the Malcolm Gladwell brand? Well, I am mean, first of all, I will echo Seth, but let's, for the sake of the discussion, uh, well, if you mean by that, what do people think of when they think of me? If they're readers of my books are, um, well, I suppose they think of me, I mean, I'm a Canadian, that's pretty important. Um, uh, I'm... Why is that important to you? Well, it means that I'm reasonable and mild. <laughs> um, I don't carry a gun, you know, I, I think people should get along. Um, I would say... I mean, I you know, some people say that I'm a contrarian, but I actually don't think I am a contrarian. I think I'm the opposite of a contrarian. I actually am, I think I, that most of what I say is very, very, very commonsensical, but I think there's interesting ways to say things that are commonsensical. So that's what I think. I know there are real contrarians out there. I'm not really one of them because I'm not that interested in conflict. Yeah, um, why, why, why do you think they think that you're a contrarian? Well, you know, people make a mistake when they... There's two different um, conditions here. Condition number one is, you have told me something I didn't know. Condition number two is, you have told me something that contradicts something I know, right? The contrarian is the second category. 
I'm the first category, I think. I think really what I'm doing is telling people things they didn't know, right? So when I think about my most successful revisionist history episodes, uh, they're really about telling you something you didn't know. They don't take an existing belief and say, you're wrong. They say, you know, I did a P, one of my favorite ones was called uh, Miss Buchanan's Period of Adjustment. And it was a podcast about the Brown. What, it, what, what effect did the Brown versus Board uh, civil rights decision have on black teachers? And that's not a, I think, I think it was one of my best episodes ever. It is not contrarian. It does not tell you that what you thought you knew is wrong. It told you you didn't know the whole story, right? I'm way, way more interested in that second thing. The whole story is what I'm interested in. Yeah. And it also seems like you're interested in looking at things in ways that people haven't considered before. And I can tick off all of your books. I mean, in fact, you know, <laughs> you know, here's nice. the here's the Malcolm Gladwell. Cause I'm a big fan. Um, see that. You know, you, you talk about that in David and Goliath. You talk about that in Talking to Strangers. Um, I mean, it's almost a thread that runs through all of your work. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, you reader, you probably didn't notice this, but I want to bring it to your attention. And sometimes it's uh, subtle. Sometimes it's a metaphor, right? Like David mm-hmm. and Goliath. So I think that's very interesting. Can I tell you a funny story? Um, sure. You're... <laughs> so I was... Um, I- I've been a fan from afar for a long time. And um, Seth Godin and I became friends about a decade ago. And and I knew that you guys knew each other and your friends, I'm sure. Uh, but I resisted you know, asking the favor for an introduction because I wanted to try and get through to you the proper way and and invite you on this show and whatnot years ago. And I tried, you know, contact Little Brown and, you know, talk to all the folks. But for some reason, and, and of course you're in high demand and you're busy, it just didn't, the timing never worked out. And like year would go, year after year, I would try and fail and try and fail. And, but I was manifesting this Malcolm Gladwell, you know, power, this aura. And one random day, in Laguna Beach, I'm with my family walking down the stairs. I've got towels, beach chairs. I've got a couple kids hanging up my neck. And who's walking up the stairs or up the ramp, you know, like two ships passing, is Malcolm Gladwell. You were there in Laguna Beach at a Wall Street Journal event or something. And I, I was like, I was like deer in the headlights. I was like, oh, wait a second. Here's the guy that, first of all, I idolize, who's like my hero, um, that I've also been chasing for like the past three years. And he just passed me. We almost brushed shoulders on the way to the beach. This is so weird. And so I, and I'm thinking, I can't approach him now. Like, he's busy. You know, I, I've got my swimsuit on. This is not appropriate. But like, I was like, so I didn't know what to do. So like, I tell my wife, I was that, that was Malcolm Gladwell. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. And she said, well, put down your stuff and go, go after him. Go, go say hello or something. And so I did put all my stuff down, put the kids down, ran back up the ramp, and you were gone like a phantom. It's funny. I, I have a terrible memory. I remember almost nothing. I remember that day. I don't remember running into you, but I was going for a run. So I, you know, the minute I got to the top of the stairs, I ran down a road. So that's why... I vanished. It wasn't that I'm some kind of magician. I just was in mid-run. Yeah. So to me, you know, my mind works in metaphors too. That's why I love your books. But I was thinking of, I was thinking about like Moby Dick a little bit. Like, you know, you're the big white whale, you know, it's always eluding me. And, you know, I was, anyway, so. <laughs> like, Well, you've, here we are. Yes, you have, you've harpooned me and I am lying, twitching and lifeless on your uh yeah well i think maybe that that i'm now sailing in different oceans and and I'm, i've now sailed into your ocean i mean we were just sitting back you know <laughs> chopping it up reminiscing about the good old days and all that <laughs> you know tracking my roots where i came from and where i'm going But 
like I say, man. Always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot and hang from the rear view. Uh-huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Uh-huh. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents. Shotgun riders, two bias, they all liars. I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired.